Well, ladies and gentlemen, I see it's 11 o'clock and I would say good morning on behalf of uh, Eurosac and SIP Eurocraft. I have a great pleasure to welcome you to our webinar series meeting today's and tomorrow's challenges sustainably with paper facts. Well, today is the first webinar edition and we will talk about the role of paper packaging in the circular oil economy. And ladies and gentlemen, we do that for different reasons. First of all, there is the EU level. Many initiatives, you all know about the EU Green Deal, the plastic strategy, the bio economy strategy. They've been launched to support a circular and bio-based economy that will influence the future of packaging design and materials severely, I would say. And then on the other hand, we have uh, in the eye, well, we have the consumers and in their eyes, packaging and its sustainability is certainly getting more important every time. And if we take those two uh, things into account, the legislation on the EU side and the consumers, certainly companies need to reflect their strategies and look out for packaging solutions that comply with upcoming consumer trends and legislation. Well, in this framework, we want to discuss with you what makes paper sacks a packaging of choice for today and, of course, for tomorrow's developments. In this first webinar, we will discuss not only the views of the or on the impact of upcoming legislation in Europe for paper packaging and how paper sacks can help comply with that, but we will also take a step backwards and uh, explaining why sustainable forest management is actually key to sustainable packaging and uh, how paper sacks can uh, support and reducing environmental impact. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a lot to talk about and I'm very happy to have two wonderful speakers for that with me this morning. And uh, well, let me introduce them. First of all, Yuri Ringmann. He is a director general of the Confederation of European Paper Industries, CEPI, and has been responsible for issues relating to sustainability, environment, and consumer protection with particular concern for packaging and food contacts for many years already. Advancing and exploring circular low carbon bioeconomy in the sector are among his, I would say, heartfelt topics. And uh, also, he is an expert in EU matters, I would say, because prior to joining CIPI in 2005 already, he worked for uh, not only the European Commission, but also the European Parliament. Well, great to have you here with us this morning. Welcome, Jori. Thank you very much. Well, and then our second speaker is Michael Sturgis. He is a research consultant at RISE, the Research Institute of Sweden. And uh, he has a lead role in numerous uh, sustainability related projects of the Institute and has interacted with government agencies as well as multinational corporations in the packaging, paper and publishing supply chain. And he also provides ongoing support to trade associations. Michael has over 25 years of experience and a strong focus on data driven analysis. That sounds very interesting. Looking forward to your speech. Welcome, Michael. Hi, Corinna. Well, oh, last but not least, for those who don't know me yet, my name is Corinna Egera. I'm a moderator in business and politics topics. And uh, well, I have the great pleasure to again guide you through this uh, well, short webinar this morning. And uh, well, talking about short webinar, we do have approximately an hour time this morning. And uh, well, we're more or less divide the session in two parts. Uh, we'll first listen to Yori's speech. And uh, then there will be time for your questions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you might want to do that by using the Q&A button and uh, just type in your question. I will see what you're asking and try to pick it up as many as I can. And then after that, we will uh, do a, an interactive survey question. So we ask you a question, but that will pop up in a window and you will see it by the time I explain how that works then. And then the second half will basically work the same way. It's the same procedure for the speech, then the Q&A, and then the survey question. And well, we'll certainly try to uh, finish on time. If there are any questions if, that you still want to ask after the session, you can do so by using the email info at eurosac.org and we'll try to answer afterwards. Well, time for our first speech. Yuri Ringman, the role of paper packaging in the circular bio economy. Looking forward to your speech. The floor is yours, Yuri. 
Thank you very much. Let me share my, my presentation. One second. You mentioned that I have been working before as a civil servant in the European institutions, and uh, it was a tough choice to, to leave that behind and then join SEPI, a small association in Brussels. But as you can see from the first slide, it's, it's a sector that we represent that is renewable, it's recycled, and it's very, very responsible. And I think I, I, I did the right choice. It's, it's been a pleasure, and I'm very proud of working for, for this sector. Today, the, the topic is the role of paper packaging in circular bioeconomy, and I will run you through three key points. One is to, to give you the idea of the long track record we have in, in sustainability. The industry has been in Europe over 800 years now, and it's been a continuous journey to, to work on sustainability, although this word sustainability we didn't always have with us, but I'll come back to that as well later. We are robust in action in the sense that we are continuously improving, and I will give you a taste on that too. But we also have some challenges ahead, namely the, the huge radical changes that we can expect in the European legislation with the Green Deal. So, as I said, we have 800 years of history of this industry in Europe, uh, and it's been all the time a journey in, in sustainability. The very origins of the paper industry started by recycling. So you may know that paper was first made by recycling old clothes to paper. But quite early on, there was an observation of what the wasps are doing. They, they, take, they chew with their little jaws, the, the tree and the wood, and they prepare these paper-like structures. And that was already triggering the, the idea that, well, could we do the same? So instead of recycling clothes, old rugs to paper, maybe we could use wood, which is another form of cellulose. And then that, that became the idea. And then in the 18th, 19th century, the mid 19th century, the technology was there. So it's called craft pulping, to take wood and produce pulp, and that can be made to paper and board, and then convert it later to the packaging or any other products that you want to make from paper and board. This was a great idea because despite the big growth that we have had in the sector since the, the 19th century, cellulose is actually the most abundant material in the nature. And since we are working, mimicking what the nature does here, for example, with wasps and with the nature by making sure that the resource we have in the nature is is there also for the future, for tomorrow. This has been really the core of our success in the sector. And you may not know it, but uh, the word sustainability is a good forestry principle term that was coined by forest people already 300 years ago in, in, in Europe. Later on, of course, since the, the 1990s, it has been lent to the other sectors and then the whole of the, the society to use in any general terms of, of sustainability. But originally it was a forestry principle, meaning that you should not harvest more than you grow so that you make sure that the, the forest stays there and then is in good health and available also for tomorrow. So this is still very much the core of our, our sector. What are we delivering with this? So first of all, we are still champions in recycling and this hasn't gone away. So we have added this element of working with fresh fibers, but we are still also leaders, actually world champions in, in recycling. We are also leaders in sustainable sourcing, and we have the highest rates in, 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 in certified materials in, in our sector. We are actually very much made in Europe industry. So we are sourced, manufactured, and recycled in Europe with European technology. But one highlight about the sustainable sourcing I would like to give you is, is to give an idea of what kind of fibers we in total use in, 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 in Europe. 67% is circular economy where 56% is paper and board back to paper and board. 
but the 11 percent is is residues from from other sectors using wood like wood chips or or wood dust from sawmills 22 percent this is residues coming from forest uh, uh, management operations and 11 percent are 11 percent of, of the fiber sources are are then logs that, that are looking more like like wood that you would recognize but even those actually are rejected by, by sawmills, because if it's a good lock, it's better to be used in higher value added applications, making furniture or making wood and construction. So even the locks that you see in, in pulp mills, they are rejected by, by the, the sawmills originally. And the key of this is that we can use the fibers accordingly to the end uses so that it's, it's the most sustainable way also in resource efficiency. So we choose the right fibers for the right applications. And sometimes it's the fresh fibers, although even as, as I explained here, the fresh fibers also are circular in the sense that they come, come from, from other sectors that didn't, were not able to use it, but they are fresh for, for paper making. So sometimes they are the best and most resource efficient source of fibers for that application. Then we are also quite clever in climate change. So first of all, like any other sector, we are advancing in, in decarbonizing our own operations. And I think Michael will give you something more specific about the, the paper sacks. But as a total sector, we have already 62% of our energy use bio-based energy, so renewable. And we have reduced our CO2 emissions radically, we are actually leading industry sector in Europe in both of these aspects. But that's not the only benefit of, of our sector, because actually we can have our materials substituting more fossil intensive other materials in the economy. And with that, we can help the whole of the society to reach these ambitious targets of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. So, well-known fact is that the forest is a sink for CO2. It's absorbing the trees when they grow, they absorb CO2 from the, the atmosphere. And that's already a huge contribution. It's about 10% of the EU annual emissions are, are absorbed by the forest. But then another 10% of the EU annual emissions are avoided by using already materials that are originating from wood, like paper sacks. And together, this combined effect of the forest-based industries is totaling to 20% of avoided emissions, which is quite a lot. And the potential is not fully tapped yet. So we could do much more if, if the policies are allowing us to do that. Finally, it's important to understand, and I was hinting to that, that it's a sector that is operating in industrial symbiotic ecosystem. So nothing is wasted. So when when the trees are harvested, the best parts are used for wood, uh, mechanical woodworking industries, sawmills, furniture, construction, and the residues of that wood when you make from the round lock, the, the square timber, then the residues can be used for, for making pulp and paper. And then in the paper loop, we are, of course, like I said, really good in, 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 in recycling. And you can do many things also from the residues that, that we get also from, from the, the later on in the processes. Then this means that the forest in Europe is growing a lot. I said already that the key principle is sustainability, which means that you harvest less than you grow. So part of the annual growth is, is, is kept in the forest, but part is used, so we, we are not even using the full potential of the annual growth. But maybe you can read in the, the slide here that the growth every year in Europe is 612 million cubic meters. And at least for me, it's sometimes puzzling to understand what these numbers mean. So what is 612 million, million cubic meters? How you can understand a number like that? Well, it's a volume. If it was a hollow volume of 612 million cubic meters, you could fit inside that volume, the entire human population of 8 billion people, actually even more. And that's the size of the European forest growth in one year alone, in Europe alone. 
So you see that it's a big strategic resource for Europe to do many things with it, including the ones that are, are the, the host of today in, in sacks made of paper. And in this setup, we are, of course, also very much advancing the bioeconomy. We are champions in bioeconomy in Europe, which is very important. And we are heavily investing as a sector to this. Actually, my part of the, the sector, the value chain, is investing twice as much as the average of the manufacturing in Europe. So we are very good, but we are also like champions always are happy to raise the bar. So we are not happy what we did well last year. We, we are always willing to do even better. In recycling, we are setting targets. We are forming alliances to, to get further. In products, we are pledging for leaner products and better products, better fit for the purpose. In processes, we are advancing with digitalization very fast. We are making sure with, with our social partners that we have the skills we need for the future. And as I mentioned in sourcing, we are, we are also driving the, the certification systems and, 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 and good quality of the forest. So not only the quantity being sufficient, but also the quality of the forest. And we are supporting the European Commission's 3 billion trees initiative, which would mean that we double the amount of trees that are planted in Europe in the next 10 years. We are preparing roadmaps, pathways, innovation partnerships, and we are having a dedicated forum in finding solutions for decarbonization of the industry and getting to the climate targets that we all need to reach. But it's not enough to think what we can do internally. We also have to see what, what is happening in our legislation. And this is the last part of, of my, my short presentation. You might recognize this lady. She's the, the president of the European Commission, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen. And when she announced the European Green Deal, she said that it's the European, Europe's man on the moon moment. And I don't know what exactly was on her mind when she said that, but I would imagine that she meant to communicate something that now we are going to do something that nobody has been able to do before. And, and, and seems all, almost impossible. And her idea is with the Green Deal to get to be the first carbon neutral continent by 2050. And how she is going to do that is by developing a kind of omni policy that is a huge package of simultaneous developments in legislation and policy that is almost like a, a unstoppable steamroller that is, is, is just moving on and, 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 and pushing away any any obstacles that might be standing there. And they have devised it in, in these 13 areas that you can see in the picture. And uh, I won't have time to go through of all of that, but what they have said is that it's supposed to be a set of deeply transformative policies. And you can trust, they, they, they mean, they say what, what they mean. If this succeeds, the way people eat, the way people live, what we wear, how we move, how we live, in what kind of houses, it will all change. And of course, it means also that how all this is produced, distributed, and, and, uh, and, and, and done in the society will also change dramatically. This is all good, but it's also a challenge because if it goes right we have lots of opportunities in particular in this value chain that we are having around the table today but if it goes awfully wrong we might just lose the competitiveness of the industries and of the business in europe and we would be just exporting pollution to other parts of the world and importing unemployment to europe so it's very critical that this steamroller that mrs von der leyen is driving with this huge set of policies gets it right. Well, we are, of course, there to, to also give her advice and give her ideas of what we can do to deliver in this Green Deal. And we are ready for that. Actually, I believe that we are the business ecosystem of the future. Whoever you are on the other side of, of this uh, webinar, I hope that you are, you are feeling that you are part of, of the future industrial ecosystem. 
the long-term trends are on our side. This is exactly what the scientists tell us. This is exactly what the consumers want to have. This policy of Mrs. von der Leyen and the European Commission is accelerating this change that is truly needed. We just need to get it right. And this industry is proactive and investing to make things happen. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Yuri, for a, well, not only very passionate and comprehensive speech, uh, but also, well, we are still on time, so we do have uh, time for a couple of questions. And, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, once again, if you have a question to Yuri, just type it in using the Q&A button, and I will see it here and can pick it up. Well, Yuri, to get started, let me just uh, ask you um, about the, uh, well, more and more paper is uh, being used to replace plastics. And, uh, well, that, uh, well, we all think we're probably uh, see the danger of bottlenecks for raw material delivery. Um, how does the industry respond to that? Well, it's, 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 of course, something that we all have to keep in mind. Uh, in general, because the, the raw materials are experiencing at the moment something unexperienced, uh, that there's shortages of everything and, and the, the cost seems to be going sky high for anything you need, energy or any material, including also when we do these investments, for example, the, the cost of steel and availability of steel for the new machines is, is, is restricted. So we are, of course, not isolated from the economy as such. But when you mention this shift from, for example, from plastics to, to paper-based materials or wood-based materials, then there are some developments that are, are helping there. And I could mention maybe three. One is that th there's also some other structural changes going on, namely in the, the sectors that are linked to the to, to way we distribute information. So newspapers, magazines, or even printing a force in your offices. I think we all know that this is going down. And then this is, of course, then releasing some resource, maybe for packaging uses that were before used for, for information industries or, or, or newspapers or others. So that's the first thing. Second is that our industries is wonderful. They, they are really innovative and they are really in investing in innovation and then research and development. So I can see in my news, in my emails, basically daily announcements of new innovations. And often it means that the same functionality is done more resource efficiently. So if you would have a paper sack of today, it wouldn't be the same as, as 20 years ago. I think it would be using much less resource, but still have the same functionality or even improved functionality. And then the third one is that, uh, that uh, we still have potential in, in, in making this industrial ecosystem more resource efficient and, and tapping into these residues. So as I said, we don't uh, harvest trees for the sake of, of making paper and board. It's residues from others. And if there's new construction made from wood, there's more sawmill dust and other residues available for making paper as well. And in addition, we can still improve, even if we are champions in recycling, we can still also tap more carefully in that potential in, in getting more recycled fibers back to us. Whatever we are collecting now today in Europe, all is used, but we can collect more and then better quality. So with those, I think we have lots of growth potential that is still perfectly sustainable. Mm -hmm. We are getting in uh, uh, audience questions. How do you plan to incentivize higher consumer traction on green products? That's a million dollar question, I think literally, if, if not euros instead of dollars, because People, I think, are instinctively thinking that, that paper is, is a sustainable material. And, and, and the, the sense, sensor, sensory feeling of paper-based products is, is usually something that people appreciate. But I think we need to give them the right information to, to confirm their instinction that, yes, this is, this is sustainable. And these are the proof points why we can, can firmly say that it is sustainable. So I think there we as, as an industry and we as a value chain have to improve our, our performance in, in telling this message to people so that they can feel confident and comfortable switching from fossil materials to, to, to paper. And this story that if we can keep the fossils in the ground, then we can actually reach the targets of, of carbon neutrality better. If we don't stop taking the fossils from the ground, then 
the target is unreachable. So our products are helping people immediately. If they switch today from plastics to, to paper, for example, it has it has immediate impact on, on, on reducing or mitigating climate change. Mm -hmm. Another interesting question. How optimistic are you in achieving the zero carbon target by 2050? Can things progress so quickly from all aspects so that this ambitious target can be really achieved? So zero carbon target by 2050. How optimistic are you? It depends if you talk about this value chain or, or this sector or if you talk about the EU as a, as a total or the, the globe as the whole planet. So I would say that uh, for our sector, I'm optimistic. We, we have the ambition of, of getting it there. We have the big number of, of the CEOs in, in, in the SEPI board that has confirmed that they want to reach this target. And we want to not only reach it in our sector, but we want to have these materials available that help the whole society to reach the target. But then, of course, there are some other sectors in the society that are not as progressive and not as willing to, to embark on this journey yet. So I don't know if the whole society can reach that target. And even when you zoom out from Europe and look at the whole planet, then you are maybe even less optimistic. But for our sector, I would say that I'm, I'm totally optimistic. And even I would say we are realistic, saying that we can reach that target. Mm -hmm. And uh, one short question is here. What is your attitude to ongoing biodiversity discussion? It's, of course, huge, important uh, discussion. And, and uh, there's another topic where we need to have better answers for people. So these voluntary schemes that we have been having for decades already in, in, in forestry in Europe and, and the paper industry has been really a key business driver for setting up these systems and then having them implemented for the whole value chain. Because the idea of the certification is that it's a chain of custody. So if there's one broken part of the chain, the whole chain is broken. So we need to see that the whole value chain is following these certification systems. And that's one of the challenges because there are lots of small players as well in between. So we need to make sure that everybody is seeing the value of that. But we are reaching high level of that. But we have not, again, succeeded in telling the story of how the certification systems and other voluntary schemes that we have in place on top of what is already legally required from the sector are helping in biodiversity. And there is good data about that already. So the biodiversity is a huge concern for any area of the society. But if there's one area where the, the trend has been reversed already is in forest. And that might be the only area so far where the trend has reversed for better. And if you imagine how it is to, to work with forest, you, you plant now for the 70 years ahead. So now we have the forest that our grandfathers were planting for us. So whatever wisdom we have gathered between our grandfathers and today will only be reflected in a few years ahead in, in times so of a few decades ahead. So these changes are very slow, but they are positive. Yeah. Uh, before you continue with our survey and then with uh, Michael, just one last question. Um, a little bit more I'd like to hear about the sustainable forest management. Maybe you can just put that in, a, in just a few sentences. <laughs> it's a uh, set that is, is ensuring that, uh, first of all, you don't harvest more than you grow. And then that you take in the aspects, uh, in, into account all the aspects of, of the, the sustainability not only the economic or social, but also ecological, including biodiversity. And that then often is, is very contextual. So Europe is, is a mosaic of all kinds of forests. And then we need to also make sure that uh, it's, it's a flexible system that, that is helping the sustainability in all kinds of forests all over Europe, not just in one part of Europe or, or not the micromanaged system from Brussels. Well, at this point, thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, you stay with me here. We'll do the first survey questions. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, a window should pop up right now. And uh, we would like to ask you uh, to state your opinion. What will have a greater effect on the development of paper sack solutions? Is it either the pressure from consumers or is it the legislation? So you have to choose either one. 
And uh, well, I'll just give you a short uh, period of time to uh, make your choice what will have the greater effect on the development of paper tax solutions. Is it either in pressure from the consumer side or the legislative side? Um, Yuri, I'm not asking you for your opinion yet. Um, but I'll ask you for a comment later on. <laughs> well, I see that uh, well, almost about half of the audience has answered so far. That's what I'm seeing right here. So, well, let's just wait another second for the uh, for the results. So, I would say we could have the results now. Yes, uh, well, Yori, it is 65% thinking it's the legislation and 35% uh, from the consumer side. Would you have guessed that? Not the exact numbers, but it's, it's uh, what I, I would personally think that it's, it's indeed this kind of combination of both. We often see that legislation is setting things started, but then business actually goes much beyond what is legally required. They, they want to do better than just a legal bare minimum. But what is the good thing about legislation is that it's often helping us to have more harmonized systems or more harmonized requirements across the market and even across the markets. Because often the EU legislation is then, then shared with other, other regions in the world. And, and then, then it's easier for industries and, and, and the users of, of, for example, Euros, the, this uh, SAC solutions to operate in all the markets when they know that the, the legal, legal compliance is, is, is more or less the same. Mm -hmm. But the pressure from the consumers and, as I said, the right choices of the consumers, that they should choose the, the product that is in a paper sack instead of in a plastic sack. That's mm -hmm. very important, of course. Otherwise, we fail on the market, even if we have the legislation behind us. Yeah, interdependent. Well, at this point, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for voting. And thank you very much, uh, Joey, for being here with us today. Thank you for your interesting speech. And uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we already continue to our second speech. Michael Sturgis is here and he'll be talking about paper sacks, a sustainable packaging option. Michael, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Let me just share my screen. Okay. So, very pleased to be here this morning and present to you about, in more detail, really about paper sacks and the sustainability credentials of paper sacks. First of all, I guess the question is, what makes a package sustainable? There are lots of different aspects to sustainability, and it's a really subjective topic. But there are some key attributes that are addressed in the legislation. And these are really bio-based and renewable, low carbon and recyclable. Okay. Now, what do we mean by those points? Bio-based products are really commercial or industrial products that are composed in whole or in significant part of biological materials, such as agricultural materials, food processing wastes, and or forestry materials. Low carbon, this is fairly self-evident, I guess, you know, it means resulting in only a relatively small net release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And of course, now we talk about net zero carbon. So we're talking a, about a, a macroeconomic level, removing carbon from the atmosphere. Recyclable. Well, the recyclability of paper-based packaging it is really nicely defined by a 2019 document prepared by CEPI, SIPPA, ACE and FEFCO called Paper-Based Packaging Recyclability Guidelines. And according to these guidelines, 
the individual suitability of a paper-based package for it, it um, recyclability is the individual suitability of a paper-based package for its factual reprocessing in the post-juice phase into new paper and board. And I guess the important part on this definition is the factual reprocessing. Factual means that collection, sorting and recycling actually takes place and exists on an industrial scale. It's not a theoretical measure of recyclability. There's proof in the market that recycling does occur. And these are the three areas that we're going to focus on in this presentation, bio-based and renewable, low carbon and recyclable. And of course, packaging must protect the product that it contains. The product actually has a far greater environmental impact than the package. So the package must be effective at getting that product safely to the end user. So let's take the first of those points, paper sacks as a bio-based and renewable solution. Well, paper sacks are manufactured predominantly from virgin wood fibres sourced from sustainably managed European forests. We know this from surveys that we do of the sector every third year. Um, we we analyse the environmental footprint of sack paper production and conversion. What we, what we learn from those surveys is that if we have an imaginary average European paper sack, then that is more than 90% bio-based material. In fact, depending on the application and the demands of the product and supply chain, many paper sacks are 100% bio-based. But it is necessary in some cases for some applications to add materials to, to, de to deliver greater barrier performance to the paper sacks. Uh, this is done in the form of uh, free films, laminates or coatings. And these have historically traditionally been fossil based polymer layers. However, developments are really strongly underway to develop bio based solutions to this um, to, to, to barrier performance. And this was really in evidence in the latest Eurosat Grand Prix for innovation where five of the eight entries were 100% bio-based solutions offering enhanced barrier performance. This is an area of, of real innovation in the sector. It's a strong focus for innovation in the paper and board industry. Um, and uh, through the European Paper Sack Research Group, we currently keep a catalogue of relevant innovations in the, the barrier area. And at the moment, that catalogue is, you know, in excess of 100 entries of relevant technologies at various stages of readiness level. So an area of real innovation. Then we have paper sacks as a low carbon solution. Well, what's really interesting is that Sackcraft paper production is very self-sufficient in terms of its energy needs. 77% of all the energy, that's heat, steam and electricity, that's required to manufacture Sackcraft paper is actually generated on the site. And 89% of the fuels used are renewable. They're bio-based and renewable. And again, you know, in fact, 81% of the fuels used are generated 
at the mill itself as byproducts of the pulp and paper making process. This includes things like bark um, from the, the pulping process, black liquor from the pulping process, etc. So I think Yuri said that the, the average um, bio-based uh, energy uh, utilization in pulp and paper production was was roughly 60 65 percent if I can remember correctly you can see in the sackcraft paper sector it's even higher now again through the survey that we perform every third year in the sector we've managed to estimate the cradle to gate fossil carbon footprint of the average European paper sack. And that fell from 92 grams of CO2e per sack in 2015 to 85 grams of CO2e in 2018. And actually, we've measured this trend over a long period of time, and the, the fall is much more impressive uh, if we go back in time to sort of 2010, 2027 time um, th there's a significant reduction in the carbon impact of paper sacks so again it links to to what yuri was saying about continuous improvement in the sector and this is really focusing on the fossil carbon footprint only but when we include biogenic CO2 removals and emissions. So the CO2 taken up in the forest and the emissions of CO2 from the biofuels used at the paper mill. Then in fact, the carbon footprint of a paper sack cradle to gate would be negative, meaning that the, actually we're having a positive impact on the climate. That's That's a bit difficult to get your head around. Um, but, you know, what it really demonstrates is that paper and paper sacks have a real role to play in the low carbon economy. Now, to try and put that into some sort of context, it's good to have a comparison. And a peer review life cycle assessment study published in 2018 found that the carbon footprint of paper sacks for cement is two and a half times smaller that, than that of form fill seal polyethylene sacks, the equivalent. OK. So 71 grams of CO2e for the paper cement sack holding 25 kilograms of cement compared to 192 grams of CO2e for the equivalent polyethylene form fill seal sack. And in fact, what's, what's even more impressive is that 18 times less fossil resources are used as a raw material within the paper sack solution. Then we have paper sacks as recyclable. So the fibres from sack craft paper are long virgin fibres. And these can be a valuable source of strong recovered fibres in the recycling industry. And we have a, a really good example of the organisation of paper sack recycling through the German scheme Reapersack. Reapersack organises the collection and recycling of, of paper sacks that have been used for or packaging cement, flour, plastic pellets and many more applications. And maybe you've seen the Reapersack logo on some of the sacks that, that you have purchased or used. And this is a real um, uh, example of how best practice can ensure that paper sacks are recovered and recycled and have a secondary use um, and become part of the, uh, the circular economy. So 
Paper sacks look good from a sustainability point of view, but they also need to be effective packaging solutions. Well, high quality sack craft papers produced from 100% natural fibres um, mean that paper sacks meet the strongest and highest performance standards, including offering significant shelf life. And there are two studies that, that have been undertaken in the, the um, realm of the European Paper Sack Research Group that demonstrate this. First of all, in 2015, a study by RISE identified that uh, in the supply chain for cement and building materials, there were extremely low damage rates for paper sacks. Damage was estimated at less than 1%. And this was comparable to the damage rates for plastic sacks for, for cement and building materials. Now, what was really interesting with this study is that what we found was the damage mechanisms for paper and plastic solutions were different, the causes of the damage, but the actual damage rates overall were comparable. And subsequently, CEPI Eurocraft and Eurosac has issued best practice handling guidelines to help supply chain stakeholders in all supply chains minimise damage uh, for all paper sack applications. So to, to drive down those losses even further. Then the second study that is really interesting is a, a study by the Norwegian Research Institute, Sintef. And this looked at storing paper and plastic sacks for cement for 18 months in an outside warehouse. And the findings of that proven through uh, testing of the properties of the cement at various stages in that 18 month period, uh, it concluded that paper sacks retain the quality and properties of cement for at least 18 months during storage. And bear in mind, the usual storage time for a cement sack is approximately two to three months. So they provided equivalent shelf life as polyethylene form fill seal, seal sacks uh, when stored under the same conditions. So, what that evidence base confirms is that paper sacks are really, you know, they are a bio-based and renewable solution. They are a low carbon solution. Of course, there's still more to be done. Uh, we heard about the, the roadmap for a low carbon paper sector from Yuri. As those, those uh, innovations are implemented, so the footprint of paper sacks will be driven down even lower. They are a recyclable paper solution. Uh, there are solutions in the market to recover and recycle paper sacks. And they are an efficient and effective packaging solution. They protect products. Um, they get them from A to B and they, they maintain the product's integrity. So that's, I guess, the case for paper sacks as a sustainable packaging solution. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and uh, for also very interesting, uh, well, short speech, but very comprehensive as well. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, it's your time to ask questions via the Q&A button now, and I'll be happy to uh, pick them up. Uh, Michael, are paper sacks with recycled fiber content on the market? There are a few examples of paper sacks with recycled content, um, but the vast majority are 100% virgin fiber uh, products. And this is because of the, the strength requirements needed from the, the packaging solution to be perform to, to perform well in the supply chain it needs to be really strong so you need those really long fibers um, and I guess this is a really good example where 
fibers are used for high value, high performance requirements uh, initially, and then fall down through the, the, the value chain into less demanding applications over time. We, we have an obvious question that goes basically in the same direction, uh, but maybe you can elaborate a little further on that. What's the biggest challenge to raise the uh, share of recycled fiber um, as raw material for paper sacks? Yeah, as I say, really, it's about the performance and the need for paper sacks to be really strong um, in the filling line, in the distribution chain. Um, and, you know, we need to uh, carry, you know, you, you think about most paper sacks, they, they might be 15 or 25 kilograms uh, of product that they contain. You need a lot of strength to, to maintain that without tearing the bag. Um, without ripping the bag, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting audience question as well now here is popping up. The cost comparison someone is wondering about. The cost comparison with plastics, do you mean? Well, it's, it's not stated here, but uh, I would guess the cost comparison, yes. Okay, so uh, that's a good question. And I don't fully have the answer. Uh, and uh, of the relative cost of paper versus plastic sacks. I guess what I would fall back on is looking forward into the future and what are the costs of paper versus plastics going to be in the future. Paper we know is going to, to be uh, part of the, the low carbon economy. Um, plastics are derived as a byproduct of, of uh, fossil fuel production. So if we need to leave fossil fuels in the ground, how are we going to develop and, and manufacture the plastics? At the moment, they get a, I guess, um, not a free ride, but they, they get a, a lot of um, uh, subsidy almost from the fact that they're a byproduct of fuel and um, of oil and gas production. Uh, if you need to extract oil and gas just to make plastics, then I guess the cost of those plastics is going to increase. Uh, it's, it's a question I've asked a lot of people, but no one's ever had an answer for me. Mm -hmm. Why the sacks themselves are recyclable? How is the contamination or a product in them managed? Someone wants to know. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question as well. This is why um, in Germany we have the Repersack scheme and it, it's a specialist uh, recycling process. And they manage to, um, they have a, a proprietary process which reduces the contamination in the used paper sacks. It cleans them uh, and makes them more suitable for recycling processes uh, so, so that certain mills can take that that product, um, that re uh, recovered fiber and make recycled products from it. Mm -hmm. Oh, and last audience question, what percentage of paper sacks do not bear eco labels? That's a good question. I, I really honestly don't know. It's not something we've looked into. Well, it might, it might be a future project for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> If I asked you on a, on a last comment on what the future of paper sack materials is, in your opinion, what would you say? Yeah, I, really, honestly, I think it will be the move towards fully bio-based paper sacks. Um, there's a, a huge amount of research going on, uh, not just in the paperboard industry, but also in the plastics industry uh, into bio-based polymers um, from renewable resources. And uh, the, the future of paper sacks will be, you know, 100% bio-based um, once we can get those materials um, performing and at a, a, a price comparable to existing fossil-based plastics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that for me is the future. It's 100% bio-based. Okay. 
Well, Michael, we're we running out of time. I, uh, I think we, we could still go on discussing for, for quite a while, but uh, well, we have to meet our schedule. And so we will uh, do our second survey question and you stay on with me at this point already. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, speech. And uh, well, let me ask the audience. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you are seeing the survey question is popping up as a window. It's the second survey question, which aspect? is most important to you when choosing a sustainable packaging solutions. Is it either the low carbon footprint or is it sustainably sourced material? So which aspect is most important to you when you choose a sustainable packaging solutions? Again, you have to decide either on either one, two, two answers are not possible in this context, and uh, well, we do want to know whether it's a low carbon footprint or the sustainably sourced material. And uh, yes, Michael, we are waiting for the uh, for our audience's answers. I, I would actually want to have three answers myself if I was able to answer. I'd also like to, to mark recyclability, but <laughs> you know, it's hard enough to choose between two, let alone three. Don't don't confuse our audience now. <laughs> <laughs> we already have more than well, well two thirds of the audience have answered so far. So I'd say we wait for three, four more seconds, and uh, then I think we should have the results very soon now. And uh, oh, this is kind of exciting to see what's going to happen. It's, all right. Oh, we got the answer. So it's seventy five percent. Uh, saying sustainably sourced material. So as a three-fourth uh, three answer, sustainably sourced material made it. Uh, Michael, would you have yeah. guessed what would have been I, your answer? I, I guess I'm a little surprised. I would have thought that low carbon footprint would have been the, the priority given all of the focus that we have on the moment at the moment on climate change and you know the COP26 conference coming up. Um, so I'm a little surprised, but nonetheless, I can understand why people have chosen that option. Well, all right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for voting. And once again, thank you very much to you, Michael, for being with us to, again today, I would say. Uh, we've seen you as speaker in uh, one or the other events uh, of Eurosac already. And uh, well, it's always a pleasure seeing you and having you with us. Thank you very much for a great speech. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for joining us today. And uh, well, I hope you've liked our session, our short webinar. Thank you for your part of participation. And uh, once again, if you have further questions, uh, please uh, send us an email to info at eurosac.org. If there is anything we could not answer today, happy to uh, give you the answer um, as soon as we can. Well, and once again, if you've liked that today, you might also want to join in into our next webinar, which is on November 5th, again, 11 to 12. And uh, we will then uh, talk about paper sets, sustainable packaging with high performance. So we'll talk about the most important functions of packaging, the quality, safety, and performance of the paper sex and our speakers which you uh, we see in the in the picture already are Susanna Anderson from Norpac, Thomas Hilling from Hoffa and Boca and Catherine Plitzko Caninon from Eurosec. So probably worthwhile uh, joining us again. I look forward to having you with us again. If you want to sign up right now you can do so you see the link to sign up in the chat and uh, I look forward to seeing you back then on November 5th and I say goodbye for today. Have a very nice, happy, sunny weekend and we'll see you again next month. Bye-bye.